Well, good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to take a different turn. We should be in chapter 13 of the book of Romans, but we're not going to go there because we're approaching the time that we call Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and also Palm Sunday or the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. So as we remember all of that, I thought it might be helpful to warm up our hearts because it seems to come so suddenly and it's so rich and so deep and there's so much to understand about it that I feel, uh, you know, one Sunday just it kind of comes and goes. It's kind of like your wedding day, you know. It's like you don't remember anything about it. You have to look at pictures and say, oh yeah, was that me? So I'm calling this journey to the cross, walking with Jesus on the way to the cross. And as we look at the scriptures, we see there was a definite time with Christ as he began to very focused look at the cross. And he knew what was coming. He knew where he was going. He knew what was going to happen. And he very deliberately steeled himself to be direct to go there. So the scripture I pulled up for today is 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and 19. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. God did something through the cross that just freaks everybody out who doesn't know him. It's like... Jesus is your savior and he came, taught and people hated him and hung him on a cross and you call that a triumphal entry? You call that a good Friday? You see, to those who are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. But to us, it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen? Amen. I was reminded of that this morning. I was combing my hair in the mirror and, and I, I, I saw the cross on my chest And it reminded me that I bear that emblem upon my very body all the time. And very often I just, uh, you know, it's a piece of jewelry. But it has significance to me. And I need to remember that. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. So let's look at what Jesus did. In Luke chapter 9, I'm basically going to be going through the book of Luke in Jesus' journey toward the cross And of course, next week, we're going to talk about the triumphal entry in Palm Sunday. It says here, verses 23 to 25, And then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. Jesus says, what does it matter if you have everything in the world, but you lose your soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? It says in another version, uh, in, in another scripture. So Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, you have to take up your cross. You know, and I've, I've heard people kind of misuse this and pull this out of context and say, well, yeah, well, that's, it's my wife. My wife is my cross. I always thought she was a blessing, but not my, not my wife, but <laughs> get all the mercy people going, oh, <laughs> giving your life away to save it. It's about doing those things that God would have you do with your life instead of the things you would naturally do in your sinful nature. And Jesus made it very, very clear what it is to be a disciple of his and what we are to do, what our obligation is. This is the point in which it came. If you see in in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 53, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up. It's an interesting term. That he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. It's a rather interesting couple of verses, isn't it? 
This is the point in Jesus' ministry when he said, okay, guys, this is it. I'm heading to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be despised by the people, and I'm going to die. But I'm going to be resurrected. And they had no idea what he was talking about. So Jesus couldn't even depend upon his friends helping him out. He had to, you know, steal himself as he went to do this. Notice the words that he was going to be received up. It's interesting because as you go to Jerusalem, it's always an incline. So being received up kind of looks toward Palm Sunday as he goes up into Jerusalem and received up. But also as he is received up, as he goes up upon the cross. And he's also received up as he comes and he's resurrected from the tomb. So you can pick any one of those three. I tend to like the last one. That he would be received up and he steadily set his face. Interesting language. You don't normally speak that way, right? You're going to set your face. You know, I, I get this idea that Luke was probably pointing us to Isaiah chapter 50, which says, I have set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Just before that, it talks about his torture and his beating. And he says that he set his face. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. It's talking about Jesus' mindset. He focused his mind on what he had to do, and he wasn't going to shrink from it. He wasn't going to run from it. He wasn't going to avoid it. He hit it head on. And aren't you glad? Amen. What a great example for us. I always think of Jesus like this which, you know, most, most people, you know, have an idea that he's looking like this, kind of sorrowful, and he's real skinny, and I have other versions, but I always look at him as being probably the most joyful man that ever walked the planet, because he had a reason to be. And yet, he also had a duty, and he understood why he was here. He understood his purpose. And so he set his face like flint. I get the idea that he was, he's not going to veer off to the left or the right, he's going straight on. And I appreciate that about Jesus. But this is this time in his ministry when he just, that's what I'm going to do. And he's, in another place, he says, so what am I going to say? He says, the time of my departure is here. And what am I going to say? Lord, save me from this? He says, for this very thing, I've been brought into the world. See, Jesus understood his purpose. He understood the plan of God. And he understood where he was going. But he also understood that he himself was put into a human body with feelings and emotions and desires and temptations which he never had before. And so I, I appreciate that about the scriptures and how balanced they are. <coughs> Moving on in chapter 9 of Luke. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And to another also, he said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who were in my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So as Jesus is approaching the cross, and it, these crowds are now following him, this is, his, this is his journey on the way to Jerusalem for the last time, he's saying some very difficult things, some very hard things to the multitude that are following him, some of them out of good, sincere hearts, others out of a desire just to see Jesus do a trick, so they thought, as a miracle. And so Jesus says, listen, this is what it takes. You can't just follow after me and, and be part of the crowd and watch and be a spectator. You have to be a disciple, which is a very different thing. It happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. You have to be careful when people speak so strongly like that. Like when we sing songs like that, you have to be careful that you don't say something that you're really not willing to back up with your behavior. And so I, I tend to walk softly as I, as I do that. But he says, you know, Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I don't know about you, but most of you have a home. 
right? Don't you? Don't you? Or you, you don't have a home. <laughs> Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you want to be homeless? I don't know about you, but home, just that word home. You know, you go to work all day, you work, you sweat, you do whatever you have to do, and then you get to go home. And it has this kind of, ah, oh, home is where my TV is. Home is where my bed is. Home is where my wife is. Home is where my kids are. Home, home is where my stuff is. Home is where I'm comfortable. And that word home just has this awesome ring to it. And Jesus said, are you willing to sacrifice all that? Because Jesus' ministry was about traveling. And if you were going to follow Jesus at that point in time, it meant you were going to go anywhere at any time that Jesus told you to go. And he says, listen, are you willing to be homeless? I ask you, are you willing to be homeless? If Jesus calls you to be a, a missionary, or God forbid, a pastor... Public speaking is one of the most feared things in the whole world for most people. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to leave the comfort and the familiarity of home and go where the Lord causes you to go? Or if the Lord is calling you to step out of a job, or if God is calling you to go wherever, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to take that step? Are you willing to give something up that he tells you to give up that might be attached to you, that might be a comfort like a home? like a pillow, like your bed? Are you willing to do that because the Lord asked you to do that? And that's what he asks. And he says, listen, you say so boldly, you're going to follow me wherever I go. Well, you want to be homeless? Be careful what you say when you tell the Lord you'll do anything, go anywhere. Because he might, he might ask you, hey, you want to be homeless? Although it would be really difficult to have people over your house for dinner and practice hospitality or have a Bible study in your home, or all the wonderful things that you can do in your home. But if the Lord calls you to go, you should go. If he tells you to move, you should move. Walking with Jesus means a sacrifice. It means there's, there are things that I'm not going to do. And it's not just that, because there are all these other things that he'll fill your life with that you do get to do, like serve, like help, like be a blessing to other people, like be filled with the Spirit and actually enjoy life where the sun looks better and the grass is greener and the, the, the air is fresher and you just appreciate and have a heart of thankfulness because God changes us from the inside out. Jesus then said to another, follow me. So instead of this guy coming up with this giant boast, I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus is calling on someone and tapping them on the shoulder and said, follow me. But he said, you notice the word but. You have to work, look out for that word but. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Well, that seems like a reasonable request. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. That sounds very heartless, doesn't it? Let the dead, let the spiritually dead bury their own physically dead, essentially. Your family can't take precedence over following Jesus. Family's got to come second. I got, I got news for all of you. My wife is not my first love. And I hope you guys could say the same thing, that Jesus is your first love, that doing what God would have you do is your first love. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, you know, there, there are lots of people that say, I'm going to be a Christian, but I'm going to wait until I die. I'm going to have a lot of fun, and I'm going to go out and, you know, do stuff and... Then I'm going to turn to Jesus. And Jesus says, you can't do that. You can't do that. I'm going to put it off till my deathbed. Oh, yeah? I'm, I'm sure the people in 9-11 didn't have a moment. And it happens. So, let me go bury my father. No, Jesus says, I want you to follow me. When he says he wants you to follow him, you should follow him right away. I know people who you, you can share the gospel with and they get to the point where they're like, you know, I would, but they're, you know, I don't want to give up my girlfriend. I don't want to give up my boyfriend. I don't want to give up the drugs. I don't want to give up the parties. I don't want to give up the, the lifestyle that I have. And I've seen people make that decision and they seem at that point to just go right off the road. 
because they were confronted with that decision to follow Jesus and they decided that something else was more important. In the Old Testament, we would call that idolatry. She'll have no other gods before me. She'll not make a molded image of anything and bow down to it and worship it and say, this is God or this is my God. But that's what you do in your job, your family, your wife, your husband, your stuff, your career, your visions of what you want for your life. When that comes before being obedient to God, that's what we do. We create an idol. And there's a separation, even of family, because when you tell people that you are a, you are a believer in Jesus Christ, I remember the first time somebody revealed to me that they were a, a born-again Christian and challenged me if, if I had ever received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I went. I was in a 69 Camaro, and I remember pressing my face against the cold window, and I was like, oh, he's a Jesus freak. And I had to respond, no, can't say I've ever done that. But there's going to be a separation. You're going to, your friends will separate from you. Your family will separate from you. And you have to be willing to let all of that go because the Lord wants to be number one in your life. Amen? Amen. It's not easy stuff. But he's telling all the multitudes this as they follow. And you may have to choose one way or the other. In fact, Jesus says, don't think that I've come to bring peace on the earth. I've come to bring division. Turn a mother against her mother-in-law. You know, the, the whole deal. And so you have to be willing to put God first above all things as we follow Christ. And he says to him, not only let the dead bury their dead, but I want you to go preach the kingdom. I don't want you to be concerned with the things of the world so much. I want you to preach the kingdom. That's just to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you guys preaching the kingdom? Do you know it's not just my job? It's not just my job. It's your job. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, this is what we do. We proclaim who he is because you have to use your face to talk about it because that's evidence that you really believe it. Walking with Jesus means first, it means he's first, and it is a declarative thing. It is not something that you hide like, yeah, I'm a closet Christian. I don't tell anybody I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for 35 years and nobody knows it. A city on a hill can't be hidden, right? Right? You can't hide a city on a hill. So it's to be declarative. It's to tell people about it. And if you feel unsure about it, well, get sure about it, right? What a quiet room. Okay. Tough audience. Verse 61. To another, he said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me bid them farewell who are in my house. Well, that doesn't seem so bad. But you know how it is. You go home to say goodbye you open yourself up to temptation that, uh, okay, well, maybe they'll talk you into not going, right? <coughs> hey, I'm going to go do this thing. I'm all psyched. I'm, I'm all ready. And then you go home to say goodbye, and they're like, oh, don't go. Why? You're going to leave us all alone? And you open yourself up to temptation, don't you? It's like, I can't go to church. I know those people want to hug me. I know with some of you, that's the reason you stay away. But he says, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I don't know how many of you do a lot of plowing here in New Jersey, but when you're plowing, you need to look forward because you have to steer the animals so that you can have a nice straight furrow. And if you don't, and if you look back, you know what ends up happening to everything in front of you? It just goes off in another direction, and you don't get nice straight furrows, and so that's going to be really hard come harvest time, um, especially if you keep looking back, because you'll basically just go in circles, because animals need to be directed. So Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow, if you're going to, all right, I'm going to do this thing, don't look back. And you know, there's problems when we look back. How many of you had problems looking back? I became a Christian, and I looked back. My friends the good times, you know, they're not so good. The imagination has a way of just coloring things. If you guys remember what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back, in Luke 17, 30 through 33, remember Lot's wife. That's, that's one of those really small verses. If you're looking for a memory verse, that's a good one because it's very small. <laughs> remember Lot's wife. 
Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life shall preserve it. You see, Lot and his daughters, they turned around, and the angel said, don't turn around. Don't look back. And so they just fled, except for his wife who turned around. You have to remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Just those three words, you got, you got a whole verse memorized. So this actually is a pillar near Sodom called Lot's wife. I think it's rather interesting. So anyway, just a little bit of trivia thrown in there for your, for your uh, entertainment. Walking with Jesus means now and progressively forward. It means that you don't turn back. You don't say, oh, remember? Man, we were at that party and we did things and we took things and we drank things and we smoked things and there's nothing good to be mined out of that not looking back. And you know, there are a lot of people that make it a habit of going back and remembering all of those things and they're tempted to go back. Those things just need to die. <laughs> At least for me, I have a whole bunch of those things, you know, what my parents did to me, what, uh, what friends did to me, uh, what, what enemies did to me, tragedies that occurred to me, and you can get all wrapped up and you can be very unforgiving and bitter by looking back. Or you can be very tempted by looking back. And Jesus says, you got to put your hand to the plow and eyes forward. Amen. Right? So, lots of words. Jesus says just after this, he says, then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper. Then he invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. By the way, there's a difference between a reason and an excuse. You guys know that? Yes. There's a reason and an excuse. The first said to him, well, I bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. I ask you, to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them out. I ask you to have me excused. And still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then his master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind because they wouldn't have an excuse. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you've commanded and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of these men who were invited shall taste of my supper. Jesus is saying heaven is like a man who has invited people to supper who made a bunch of excuses why they couldn't come. Look at the excuses. I just bought a piece of land. I got to go look at it. That's the guy who's too attached to his stuff. Lord, I'd really, you know, I'd love to go to church on Sunday, but I can make so much money on Sunday. It happens. Or, you know, Lord, I'd really like to commit myself to you, but if I stop doing all this, then, you know, I'm going to have to give stuff up and I might have to give it away to other people. You're too attached to your stuff. You're going to miss the kingdom because the stuff has a hold on you. I bought a piece of ground. I've got to go see it. Have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. In other words, uh, that, these are the instruments of his, of his job, of his work, or, or it could be transportation. But Lord, I just bought a Lamborghini. I, I, I can't come to you with that because, I mean, I have all these car shows to go to and, and I have maintenance I need to do and I need to buff it and wax it. And so I, I can't come to you, Lord, because my Lamborghini is the most important thing in my life. You see, Jesus is talking about priorities. And he's saying, if, if I'm not your priority, then, if, then I can't be on the list anywhere else. He requires first billing. 
the one came and he said, I, I have married a wife, therefore I can't come. I don't know what that means. Did, did she say you can't go? <laughs> or was it that he was so distracted because he had a relationship and that relationship distracted him from Christ? And that can happen. People can lead you away from Christ. The Bible says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, therefore honor God with your body. Don't be unequally yoked with non-believers. The scripture is very clear about that. You don't hook yourself up either in a business transaction or in a close personal accountable relationship and certainly not in a marriage relationship with somebody who's not a believer. Because like Solomon, they're gonna make you worship other gods who are not gods at all. And so be careful of that. So I have a wife, therefore I can't come. And they all had these excuses. And he says, go out and find, look in hedges. <laughs> Anybody in there? You know, find the blind, the weak, the, find all these people that they've got nowhere better to go and tell them, I have this awesome, awesome meal set up. That's the invitation that Jesus gives to each one of us. He gives us an invitation to sit with him and have relationship with him and eat with him. In fact, Jesus does that a lot. All of the post appearings of Jesus after his resurrection, there was food. And I like that. <laughs> and he said, none of the ones who were originally invited are going to taste my supper. And that's a sad thing, right? That people would prefer stuff or other relationships with other people rather than a relationship with the only God. And yet it happens all the time, and it's, and it's so sad to see. So walking with Jesus means accepting his invitation. It's just as simple as accepting an invitation and going. But it's not just the invitation. It begins with the invitation. The invitation to come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me and learn from me and take my yoke upon you, because my burden is light. My yoke is easy. And you will find rest for your weary souls. It's an invitation for us to come. But it's not just an invitation where, okay, I said a prayer, you know, I'm, I'm all good. I, I knelt down, I got a Bible, it sits on a coffee table, I never read it, but, you know, we're all good. I accepted the invitation. I'll go to heaven, but then there are all these other things that take precedence in your life, and that's not what Jesus wants. So, walking to the cross, Jesus is hitting them with a lot of very heavy things. Once it begins with an invitation, and number two, it ends with this obligation of what it is to be a disciple. He goes on in Luke 14 to say, now great multitudes went with him, with Jesus, as he was walking toward Jerusalem for the last time. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And for which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid a foundation, he's not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build, he was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes out against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and he asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You see, Jesus just started talking about how it begins with this invitation about coming and about making him a priority, and it ends with being a disciple, giving up everything to follow Jesus. So there's some interesting things in this passage. He's speaking to the multitudes. Whenever you see the multitudes in the New Testament, you have to understand this is a mixed multitude. It's all kinds of people, believers, unbelievers, make-believers. They're just all mixed up together. And he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, by the way, this word hate is not the word hate that you know. It's not like, I hate you. It's more like when I'm playing cards with my wife and she beats me and I say, I hate you. <laughs> it's not real hate. But what this means is that you prefer less, that you choose second, not first. 
It means that you forsake, you don't choose. Because every choice you make, you realize there's something you didn't choose. I put this shirt on today. Some of you think it was a good idea, some of you don't. But I chose. I hated everything else to pick this. <laughs> but after this is laundered and hangs in my closet, I will hate this and choose something else. You see, it's the thing, it's the road not traveled. It's the, it's the thing not chosen. And his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, his sisters, yes, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's very clear, isn't it? So it's not just accepting an invitation. It's about following 100%. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Do you know Jesus said this before he was crucified? You have to take up your cross and follow me. I find that very interesting. Remember, Jesus set his mind, he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. He knew where he was going and it was top of mind and it just comes pouring out of his mouth in his teaching. If you don't take up your cross behind me, then you're not worthy to be my disciple. And the cross speaks of crucifixion. It speaks of the death penalty. It speaks of torture. It speaks of being punished for something you didn't do. And Jesus says, unless you're willing to pick up the cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. So, there's a lot of stuff in this passage. And I, oh, here we are. You know what? I'm a bonehead because I'm going backwards. I just messed everything up. So we accept his invitation and we have to be his disciple and leave everything. That means you say no to everything, just like a three-year-old. Hey, you want to go out? No. Hey, what? No. Right? You ever have a three-year-old? Just no, 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 no. You know, there's a lot of freedom in the word No. All kinds of life comes out of the word no. Those of you who don't like the word no don't understand what I'm talking about. When you're like, okay, I really don't want to, but I will. You know, just say no. No. How come? Well, I don't want to. Oh, well, I, I don't know. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, that's dangerous. Just say no. Just say no. God called you to do this thing? If he hasn't, don't do it. It can be something innocent. It can be the purchase of something. It can be a vacation somewhere. It can be anything. If you haven't laid it before the Lord, say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And if he hasn't given you the thumbs up, don't do it. Just say no. Because what we want to do is say yes to Jesus, which means we say no to everything else. And we have to take up the cross and follow him. And then Jesus goes into this parable, which I'm not sure that everybody understands. He talks about building a tower. Which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? What tower is he talking about? He's talking about living your life, either as a disciple or not, either picking up the cross or not. And you want to make a really quick assessment and say, let me see. If I build my life and I do what I want and then I get to retirement age and I got a million dollars in the bank, then maybe I'll retire and I'll go somewhere, then I'll come to Jesus. Yeah, how's that working out for you? It's just putting it off. It's an interesting thing because when the scripture talks about a tower, the only tower I can remember is the Tower of Babel, which was started and never finished. Because they didn't have the resources. Why didn't they have the resources? Because God confused it. God said, nope, you're not going to do this. And unplugged it. And they all started speaking in different languages. That's the reverse of speaking in tongues. As everybody spoke in tongues and didn't understand anything, it was no interpretation. Which is an interesting thing. And they weren't able to finish the tower. You think you're building your life. You think you have a vision. You think you know what you want to do with your life. Guess what? When it's all over and you breathe your last and they put you in a box and put you in the ground and you're standing before the Lord God Almighty, how's that working out for you? You don't have what it takes to impress God to get into heaven. 
You can't build a tower that high. You can't be that good because we're all sinners at our very core. So let's make a quick assessment. Do I have what it takes to be acceptable before God in myself? No. That is counting the cost. Because most people say, you know, you've got to count the cost before you come to Jesus because you never know. You have to understand it's really, 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 really hard. How could you possibly know how hard it was going to be? I had no idea what marriage was. And I read some books. <laughs> and I saw some people who were married. And I said, oh, I won't do that. I won't do that either. That looks like a pretty good idea. No, no these guys got it together except for that one thing. And, you know, like I, I thought I understood. I know exactly the path I'm going to travel. And then I got married. And it was nothing like I thought. I've had a number of jobs. And you know what? They were nothing like what I thought. I mean, I asked people that worked there. I asked people that had the position before me. I, I mean, I did, I did research. And when I got in it, it was completely different. How can you count the cost? You know how you count the cost? You say, Lord, I don't have what's in me. I am nothing without you. That's how you count the cost. And the second one is very much like it. Or what if a king going to make war against another king, doesn't he sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes after him with 20,000 men? Now imagine you're a king and you have 10,000 men fighting for you, but you're going to go to war against a guy that's got 20,000 men. What are your chances? Don't tell me 50-50. There are two to one odds that you will lose. Okay, that, your bookie will tell you that. Guess who the king is with 10,000 men? You. Guess who the king with 20,000 men is? God. You're going to go up against God? You think you can compete with him? You think you can tell him what to do with your life? You're going to just do what you want to do? Guess what? You ain't going to win that. That's Jesus' point. And he says... Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and he asks for conditions of peace. That's a better idea. Lord, I've got nothing in and of myself and I know I can't beat you and I know I'm not good enough and I don't deserve to go to heaven and I know that there's a hell and I deserve to be there. God, I want to make peace. Can we do that? Because I really don't want to go to battle with you because I know I'm going to lose. Thank God for Jesus Christ who's our emissary. He's the one who made peace in his own body on the tree, on the cross. He was the one who made peace with us. So we don't have to worry about going to battle with God or standing before his throne and have to give an excuse or a reason why we should get into heaven because there isn't one except for Christ. And we have to take up our cross and follow him. This is reasonable stuff, isn't it? Jesus is reasoning all this out. Walking with Jesus means reasoning it out. Let's think about this for a minute. Jesus is inviting you to a banquet where it's going to be awesome. And he spared no expense. And you can either say, no, I'm too busy with other things of lesser value, or say yes. And if you say yes, Jesus wants everything. He wants all of it. Luke 23, 26. Now, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said you have to take up your, you have to take up your cross and bear it and follow me. And here it actually happened literally during the procession where Jesus was being led to Golgotha. And there was somebody who actually had to carry the cross. Any of you know where Cyrene is? It's in Africa. I think it's significant that they picked a black guy to take the cross of Jesus Christ. What a privilege that is. And by the way, he had a couple of sons, and they ended up sticking around and staying in the church. So his sons actually became believers and were, were pillars in, in, in the church. Can you imagine 
being told to carry Jesus' cross. Now, he was coming from out of country, coming into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. If you know anything about the Passover, you don't walk on graves because it makes you unclean. You can't touch any dead thing because it makes you unclean. You can't even have a menstrual cycle. I mean, there's like all kinds of things that the Bible's about, about abstaining from blood of any kind. And this guy who's made himself ceremonially clean now has to carry a bloody cross for Jesus, getting blood all over him and making himself unclean that he couldn't partake in the Passover. And yet it was that very blood that makes us clean. Simon the Cyrenian was able to carry the cross of Jesus Christ and Luke is the only one that says behind him. I find that rather significant. Jesus is asking us to follow him. Number one, it begins with accepting his invitation and asking him to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. And if you've never done that, you could do it today. And then saying, Lord, I give you everything. How many of you have something that you can give to Jesus today? I do. And as we come up upon this Holy Week, it's called, and as we think about Palm Sunday and we think about the resurrection, we have such a great opportunity to kind of dig deep in our heart and let the Lord have more real estate inside of us. And so that's why I took a step away from Romans to just kind of remind us. And as we walk with Jesus on our way to the cross, we want to remember how precious it is and how important it is and how significant it is that we don't miss it and it goes by in a blur.